the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today we have the Feast of St. Marcellus I, Pope and Martyr in the early church. We'll also hear about a couple of other saints for today, St. Macarius the Elder, as well as St. Fursi of Perone. Um, uh, St. Fursi of Perone, that's an interesting Irish name with a uh, French uh, last name. That's where he died, born in Ireland, died in France, and venerated there is where his body was kept. Uh, so let's see, it's a good place to start then, St. Fursi of Perone, uh, born in the 6th century, around the year 567, and um, educated, or rather baptized, as a child by St. Brendan the Navigator. Um, he um, was a, became a monk, a priest, and an abbot, uh, but he left his monastery to evangelize, uh, preaching for 12 years over Ireland, uh, building all kinds of monasteries, and then move, moving over to England, and then finally France. He was noted for uh, a number of miracles, including raising a man from the dead. Uh, now, the reason he um, left his monastery as abbot was because of uh, an ecstatic series of ecstatic visions he had in prayer. In these visions, he saw the immense struggle between good and evil. He had visions of heaven and hell. And the description of these visions uh, are contained in a work called The Visions of Fursi. And um, this would be the influence for later works, especially Dante's Divine Comedy. So we have a little bit may, may a more history on, on the um, uh, some liter literature there, right? This, this literature is not just entirely fantastic. It comes from uh, reality. So a rather interesting thing to note there. Dante's Divine Comedy. Dante drew inspiration from the visions of St. Fursi. Uh, so in these visions, um, you know, and it's kind of like similar to, I guess, Bridget uh, of Sweden or um, Hildegard of being in some of these other saints who had visions in, in, in around this time or even earlier, uh, 500 years earlier. But in these visions was revealed to him the horrible state of man and sin, uh, the beauty of virtue. He could hear angelic choirs singing, um, and he could see uh, demons fighting. Um, he saw actually angels contending uh, with the demons over uh, his soul. Um, he saw the fires of hell. Um, and among this, the, uh, uh, the angels he saw, uh, actually some of the Irish saints, some, some saints in Ireland there from a few hundred years previous, uh, these gave him spiritual instruction concerning the duties of ecclesiastics and monks and abbots, the dreadful effects of pride and disobedience, the horror of sin. Uh, they predicted famine and pestilence, which came to pass. Um, and uh, he also received instruction from an angel, uh, which he was in ecstasy for an entire day, and he was given instructions for preaching and for a 12-year apostolic mission. And it was after that vision that he began his uh, missionary efforts, leaving his monastery and going forth. Uh, so rather interesting uh, life of St. Uh, Fursi. Oh, and he would die, um, eventually would go 12 years in Ireland, a few years in England, and then in France. He would meet King uh, Clovis there, uh, would assist in the evangelizing efforts of the, of the newly converted uh, Franks. And then he would end up dying in that city of um, uh, Perone, uh, where he was venerated. His body was incorrupt for about a month. Uh, waiting for burial, his body was incorrupt and giving off a sweet odor uh, until he was finally interred. Uh, thus, St. Fursi of Perone. Uh, another feast, uh, as I mentioned today, St. Macarius the Elder. And I really, his life deserves kind of a sermon of its own, but I just there's one uh, instance in particular. Um, and it is that he was, you know, of course, doing all the um, austerities, fastings of the Desert Fathers, eating very often. He would eat once per week. Uh, he would go entire days without water, uh, so ex just extremely difficult. Um, miracles and all kinds of things. Um, now, one of them, uh, a young man came to him for spiritual advice, and St. Macarius told him to go to a graveyard and um, upbraid the dead, and then afterwards go and flatter them. And so the young man came back, and the saint asked him uh, what answer the dead had made to him. Not at all, said the young man, either to reproaches or to praises. Then, replied Macarius, Go and learn yourself neither to be moved by injuries or flatteries. If you die to the world and to yourself, you will begin to live to Christ. Uh, very good advice. Uh, but he was given, uh, God revealed to St. Macarius that um, despite all of his fastings, his efforts, his obedience, he had not yet attained the perfection of uh, these two women, uh, married women, who lived in a nearby town. Uh, they were more perfect than he. So he made them a visit and um, to learn the manner by which they sanctified themselves. And this is, I'm reading this account from Butler's Lives of the Saints. And it says, uh, Butler says, 
They were extremely careful never to speak any idle or rash words. They lived in the constant practice of humility, patience, meekness, charity, resignation, mortification of their own will, and conformity to the humors of their husbands and others, as long as the, as long as the divine law did not interpose. In a spirit of recollection, they sanctified all their actions by ardent aspirations, by which they strove to praise God and most fervently to consecrate to the divine glory all the powers of their soul and body. Uh, so what an account from the life of St. Macarius that despite his incredible efforts, uh, yet these two married women, by faithfully fulfilling their state in life, had attained a greater perfection. And thus we see the judgments of man are not the judgments of God. So uh, maybe a little bit of hope and um, encouragement to um, uh, you know, those those married women out there, especially those, um, oh, just uh, the, the, the tremendous burdens of homeschooling, of a large family, <clears throat> and, um, you know, very little religious instruction or even religious support. Uh, you know, in this time, it's hard to go to Mass. It's hard to find um, a church with, with, with um, you know, that isn't in some way um, tainted somehow by modernism. So uh, take courage there. Uh, any any married women out there with lots of kids or even, you know, whatever it may be, um, there is hope for you. Judgments of God are not the judgments of men. Uh, and then for our um, um, actual saint for today, St. Macarius I, um, he, he was in that transition period before uh, the Diocletian uh, persecution had ended, um, or rather it had just ended, but before Constantine had become emperor and um, um, started out the, uh, the, the eventual Christendom, uh, um, reign of the empire. So he was elected pope. Marcellinus was in, elected pope in the year 308. Uh, the persecutions had just ended. There hadn't been a pope in nearly four years. Uh, pope Marcellinus, his predecessor, had died in 304. So the church was in disarray. The church was, it was in chaos. The administration was neglected. There was infighting among the clerics. There was controversies. There was heresies. And there was the, uh, the lapsi, those who had apostatized and then wanted to be readmitted to the church. And we've heard in other sermons all the difficulties surrounding um, uh, those uh, that that question, right? If they're going to be readmitted, which they are, uh, should they do penance? How much penance? If they were clerics, should they receive? Do they have to be reordained? Should they get their office back? All those kinds of questions. He had to deal with that. Right? He, had to, he had to deal with it. It was very difficult. Um, and in fact, because of that difficulty, uh, Marcellus properly said no, they can be readmitted, but they have to do penance. And it wasn't, I mean, I mean, it was it was extreme, you know, um, uh, according to our, you know, uh, standards, you know, a period of, of um, kind of probation, fasting on bread and water, this kind of thing. Um, uh, so Pope Marcellinus insisted they do penance, but the lapsi themselves insisted that they shouldn't have to do any penance. And as a sign of their, I guess you could say, bad will, that they were on the wrong side, they uh, rioted. They, they um, caused such a ruckus that the emperor... Um, who, who wasn't act, you know, actively persecuting Catholics at the time, but he just didn't want any trouble. And so when he found out, you know, he, he blamed Marcellus for this riot of the Lopsy, and so he sentenced, sentenced him to work in the stables, taking care of horses uh, used for public transportation. And this is very difficult work, and, and Pope Marcellus is, is an old man by this point, and so he's in these filthy stables, um, and eventually he's rescued by a woman, uh, Lucia, uh, Lucina, and she takes him to her house, and there he kind of he governs the church, says mass, and then the emperor finds out his whereabouts. And so, um, kind of in one of those I don't know moments of brilliant pagan wickedness, says that if Pope Marcellus is not going to work in the stables, then he's going to bring the stables to Marcellus. And so he quarters uh, these horses in the house of the matron Lucina, and there Marcellus is once again forced into filthy hard labor and dies shortly thereafter. Um, so, you know, Pope Marcellus's his pontificate was, was brief. It didn't even last a year. Uh, but his example of faith, courage, and humility helped the church through a difficult time. And the dawn was so close. Pope Marcellus died in the year 309, and then just a few years later, in 313, the emperor Constantine would issue the Edict of Milan. And, um, you know, in, in, that, in that short amount of time, the pope would go from shoveling manure in a stable to presiding over one of the greatest councils in church history, the Council of Nicaea, with public recognition and honor. So what a turnaround. Right? And again, in just you know, less, than, less than 20 years, uh, that is the change in the church. Uh, but Pope Marcellus never saw it. All he saw was himself shoveling uh, manure and, and filth and so on, 
And so what must he have thought? Like the church is in disarray. It needs incredible leadership. It needs incredible work. Uh, there's controversies. There's, there's the lopsy that wasn't even resolved. He was put in prison. What was he supposed to think? Yeah, you know, here I am shoveling manure, and I'm supposed to be the pope. I've got so much to do, and yet here I am. Uh, but that is that is precisely how God wants to work sometimes, is, is, is that, I mean, Christ himself worked his greatest healing miracle uh, when his hands and feet were nailed down and he couldn't move a, a muscle. He could barely even breathe. That's when Christ healed the entire world. And so that is a great lesson for us in that um, it is precisely when we can do the least that, that, that God works through us, through our resignation and humility, uh, we work the most. And certainly, right, lest we think that working in the stables was an insult, uh, let us not forget that Christ's child himself was born in a stable. And certainly Pope Marcellus would have thought of this as he was tending those animals, um, uh, that he was happy to imitate Christ our Lord. If it was good enough for Christ, it's good enough for me. And that can be our, our attitude in the midst of persecution, trials, insults, contempt, heresy, bad leadership, whatever else in the church. Uh, Christ himself suffered all these things, and he triumphed in the midst of them. They weren't an obstacle to him, and they won't be an obstacle to us either because it's not by our efforts, it's by his efforts. So though we may, we may not see it, uh, the dawn could be right around the corner. So let's keep in mind um, all of these uh, saints we've heard for today and ask for their intercession in persevering through these difficult times. Uh, St. Fursi of Perone, uh, pray for us. St. Macarius the Elder, pray for us. Uh, St. Marcellus, Pope and Martyr, pray for us. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.